Chapter six of the Absentee by Maria Edgeworth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The tide did not permit the packet to reach the pigeon house, and the impatient Lord Colambre stepped into a boat and was rowed across the Bay of Dublin. It was a fine summer morning. The sun shone bright on the Wicklow Mountains. He admired, he exulted in the beauty of the prospect, and all the early associations of his childhood and the patriotic hopes of his riper years swelled his heart as he approached the shores of his native land. But scarcely had he touched his mother earth when the whole course of his ideas was changed, and if his heart swelled, it swelled no more with pleasurable sensations for instantly he found himself surrounded and attacked by a swarm of beggars and harpies with strange figures and stranger tones some craving his charity some snatching away his luggage and at the same time bidding him never trouble himself and never fear a scramble in the boat and on shore for bags and parcels began and an amphibious fight betwixt men who had one foot on sea and one on land was seen and long and loud the battle of trunks and portmanteaus raged the vanquished departed clinching their empty hands at their opponents and swearing inextinguishable hatred while the smiling victors stood at ease each grasping his booty bag basket parcel or portmanteau and your honour where will these go where will we carry em all to for your honour was now the question without waiting for an answer most of the goods were carried at the discretion of the porters to the custom-house where to his lordship's astonishment after this scene of confusion he found that he had lost nothing but his patience all his goods were safe and a few tin pennies made his officious porters happy men and boys blessings were showered upon his honour and he was left in peace at an excellent hotel in blank street dublin he rested refreshed himself recovered his good humour and walked into the coffee-house where he found several officers english irish and scotch one english officer a very gentlemanlike sensible-looking man of middle age was sitting reading a little pamphlet when lord colambre entered he looked up from time to time and in a few minutes rose and joined the conversation it turned upon the beauties and defects of the city of dublin sir james brooke for that was the name of the gentleman showed one of his brother officers the book which he had been reading observing that in his opinion it contained one of the best views of dublin which he had ever seen evidently drawn by the hand of a master though in a slight playful and ironical style it was an intercepted letter from china the conversation extended from dublin to various parts of ireland with all which sir james brooke showed that he was well acquainted observing that this conversation was particularly interesting to lord colambre and quickly perceiving that he was speaking to one not ignorant of books sir james spoke of different representations and misrepresentations of ireland in answer to lord colambre's inquiries he named the works which had afforded him most satisfaction and with discriminative not superficial celerity touched on all ancient and modern authors from spencer and davies to young and beaufort lord colambre became anxious to cultivate the acquaintance of a gentleman who appeared so able and willing to afford him information sir james brooke on his part was flattered by this eagerness of attention and pleased by our hero's manners and conversation so that to their mutual satisfaction they spent much of their time together whilst they were at this hotel and meeting frequently in society in dublin their acquaintance every day increased and grew into intimacy an intimacy which was highly advantageous to lord colambre's views of obtaining a just idea of the state of manners in ireland sir james brooke had at different periods been quartered in various parts of the country had resided long enough in each to become familiar with the people and had varied his residence sufficiently to form comparisons between different counties their habits and characteristics hence he had it in his power to direct the attention of our young observer at once to the points most worthy of his examination and to save him from the common error of travellers 
the deducing general conclusions from a few particular cases or arguing from exceptions as if they were rules lord colambre from his family connections had of course immediate introduction into the best society in dublin or rather into all the good society of dublin in dublin there is positively good company and positively bad but not as in london many degrees of comparison not innumerable luminaries of the polite world moving in different orbits of fashion but all the bright planets of note and name move and revolve in the same narrow limits lord colambre did not find that either his father's or his mother's representations of society in dublin resembled the reality which he now beheld lady clonbrony had in terms of detestation described dublin such as it appeared to her soon after the union lord clonbrony had painted it with convivial enthusiasm such as he saw it long and long before the union when first he drank claret at the fashionable clubs this picture unchanged in his memory and unchangeable by his imagination had remained and ever would remain the same the hospitality of which the father boasted the son found in all its warmth but meliorated and refined less convivial more social the fashion of hospitality had improved to make the stranger eat or drink to excess to set before him old wine and old plate was no longer the sum of good breeding the guest now escaped the pomp of grand entertainments was allowed to enjoy ease and conversation and to taste some of that feast of reason and that flow of soul so often talked of and so seldom enjoyed lord colambre found a spirit of improvement a desire for knowledge and a taste for science and literature in most companies particularly among gentlemen belonging to the irish bar nor did he in dublin society see any of that confusion of ranks or predominance of vulgarity of which his mother had complained lady clonbrony had assured him that the last time she had been at the drawing-room at the castle a lady whom she afterwards found to be a grocer's wife had turned angrily when her ladyship had accidentally trodden on her train and had exclaimed with a strong brogue i'll thank you ma'am for the rest of my tail sir james brooke to whom lord colambre without giving up his authority mentioned the fact declared that he had no doubt the thing had happened precisely as it was stated but that this was one of the extraordinary cases which ought not to pass into a general rule that it was a slight instance of that influence of temporary causes from which no conclusions as to national manners should be drawn i happened continued sir james to be quartered in dublin soon after the union took place and i remember the great but transient change that appeared from the removal of both houses of parliament most of the nobility and many of the principal families among the irish commoners either hurried in high hopes to london or retired disgusted and in despair to their houses in the country immediately in dublin commerce rose into the vacated seats of rank wealth rose into the place of birth new faces and new equipages appeared people who had never been heard of before started into notice pushed themselves forward not scrupling to elbow their way even at the castle and they were presented to my lord lieutenant and to my lady lieutenant for their excellencies for the time being might have played their vice-regal parts to empty benches had they not admitted such persons for the moment to fill their court those of former times of hereditary pretensions and high-bred minds and manners were scandalized at all this and they complained with justice that the whole tone of society was altered that the decorum elegance polish and charm of society was gone and i among the rest said sir james felt and deplored their change but now it is all over we may acknowledge that perhaps even those things which we felt most disagreeable at the time were productive of eventual benefit formerly 
a few families had set the fashion from time immemorial everything had in dublin been submitted to their hereditary authority and conversation though it had been rendered polite by their example was at the same time limited within narrow bounds young people educated upon a more enlarged plan in time grew up and no authority or fashion forbidding it necessarily rose to their just place and enjoyed their due influence in society the want of manners joined to the want of knowledge in the new set created universal disgust they were compelled some by ridicule some by bankruptcies to fall back into their former places from which they could never more emerge in the meantime some of the irish nobility and gentry who had been living at an unusual expense in london an expense beyond their incomes were glad to return home to refit and they brought with them a new stock of ideas and some taste for science and literature which within these latter years have become fashionable even indispensable in london that part of the irish aristocracy who immediately upon the first incursions of the vulgarians had fled in despair to their fastnesses in the country hearing of the improvements which had gradually taken place in society and assured of the final expulsion of the barbarians ventured from their retreats and returned to their posts in town so that now concluded sir james you find a society in dublin composed of a most agreeable and salutary mixture of birth and education gentility and knowledge manner and matter and you see pervading the whole new life and energy new talent new ambition a desire and a determination to improve and be improved a perception that higher distinction can now be obtained in almost all company by genius and merit than by airs and dress so much for the higher order now among the class of tradesmen and shopkeepers you may amuse yourself my lord with marking the difference between them and persons of the same rank in london lord colambre had several commissions to execute for his english friends and he made it his amusement in every shop to observe the manners and habits of the people he remarked that there are in dublin two classes of tradespeople one who go into business with intent to make it their occupation for life and as a slow but sure means of providing for themselves and their families another class who take up trade merely as a temporary resource to which they condescend for a few years trusting that they shall in that time make a fortune retire and commence or recommence gentlemen the irish regular men of business are like all other men of business punctual frugal careful and so forth with the addition of more intelligence invention and enterprise than are usually found in englishmen of the same rank but the dublin tradesmen pro tempore are a class by themselves they begin without capital buy stock upon credit in hopes of making large profits and in the same hopes sell upon credit now if the credit they can obtain is longer than that which they are forced to give they go on and prosper if not they break turn bankrupts and sometimes as bankrupts thrive by such men of course every short cut to fortune is followed whilst every habit which requires time to prove its advantage is disregarded nor with such views can a character for punctuality have its just value in the head of a man who intends to be a tradesman to-day and a gentleman to-morrow the ideas of the honesty and the duties of a tradesman and of the honour and the accomplishments of a gentleman are oddly jumbled together and the characteristics of both are lost in the compound he will oblige you but he will not obey you he will do you a favour but he will not do you justice he will do anything to serve you but the particular thing you order he neglects he asks your pardon for he would not for all the goods in his warehouse disoblige you 
not for the sake of your custom but he has a particular regard for your family economy in the eyes of such a tradesman is if not a mean vice at least a shabby virtue which he is too polite to suspect his customers of and particularly proud to prove himself superior to many london tradesmen after making their thousands and their tens of thousands feel pride in still continuing to live like plain men of business but from the moment a dublin tradesman of this style has made a few hundreds he sets up his gig and then his head is in his carriage and not in his business and when he has made a few thousands he buys or builds a country house and then and thenceforward his head heart and soul are in his country house and only his body in the shop with his customers whilst he is making money his wife or rather his lady is spending twice as much out of town as he makes in it at the word country house let no one figure to himself a snug little box like that in which a warm london citizen after long years of toil indulges himself one day out of seven in repose enjoying from his gazebo the smell of the dust and the view of passing coaches on the london road no these hibernian villas are on a much more magnificent scale some of them formerly belonged to irish members of parliament who are at a distance from their country seats after the union these were bought by citizens and tradesmen who spoiled by the mixture of their own fancies what had originally been designed by men of good taste some time after lord colambre's arrival in dublin he had an opportunity of seeing one of these villas which belonged to mrs rafferty a grocer's lady and sister to one of lord clonbrony's agents mr nicholas garraghty lord colambre was surprised to find that his father's agent resided in dublin he had been used to see agents or stewards as they are called in england live in the country and usually on the estate of which they have the management mr nicholas garraghty however had a handsome house in a fashionable part of dublin lord colambre called several times to see him but he was out of town receiving rents for some other gentleman as he was agent for more than one property though our hero had not the honour of seeing mr garraghty he had the pleasure of finding mrs rafferty one day at her brother's house just as his lordship came to the door she was going on her jaunting car to her villa called tusculum situate near bray she spoke much of the beauties of the vicinity of dublin found his lordship was going with sir james brooke and a party of gentlemen to see the county of wicklow and his lordship and party were entreated to do her the honour of taking in his way a little collation at tusculum our hero was glad to have an opportunity of seeing more of a species of fine lady with which he was unacquainted the invitation was verbally made and verbally accepted but the lady afterwards thought it necessary to send a written invitation in due form and the note she sent directed to the most right honourable the lord viscount colambre on opening it he perceived that it could not have been intended for him it ran as follows my dear juliana o'leary i have got a promise from colambre that he will be with us at tusculum on friday the twentieth in his way from the county of wicklow for the collation i mentioned and expect a large party of officers so pray come early with your house or as many as the jaunting car can bring and pray my dear be elegant you need not let it transpire to mrs o g but make my apologies to miss o g if she says anything and tell her i'm quite concerned i can't ask her for that day because tell her i'm so crowded and am to have none that day but real quality yours ever and ever anastasia rafferty p s and i hope to make the gentleman stop the night with me so will not have beds excuse haste and compliments etc tusculum sunday the fifteenth after a charming tour in the county of wicklow where the beauty of the natural scenery and the taste with which those natural beauties had been cultivated 
far surpassed the sanguine expectations lord colambre had formed his lordship and his companions arrived at tusculum where he found mrs rafferty and miss juliana o'leary very elegant with a large party of the ladies and gentlemen of bray assembled in a drawing-room fine with bad pictures and gaudy gilding the windows were all shut and the company were playing cards with all their might this was the fashion of the neighbourhood in compliment to lord colambre and the officers the ladies left the card-tables and mrs rafferty observing that his lordship seemed partial to walking took him out as she said to do the honours of nature and art his lordship was much amused by the mixture which was now exhibited to him of taste and incongruity ingenuity and absurdity genius and blunder by the contrast between the finery and vulgarity the affectation and ignorance of the lady of the villa we should be obliged to stop too long at tusculum were we to attempt to detail all the odd circumstances of this visit but we may record an example or two which may give a sufficient idea of the whole in the first place before they left the drawing-room miss juliana o'leary pointed out to his lordship's attention a picture over the drawing-room chimney-piece is not yet a fine piece my lord said she naming the price mrs rafferty had lately paid for it at an auction it has a right to be a fine piece indeed for it cost a fine price nevertheless this fine piece was a vile daub and our hero could only avoid the sin of flattery or the danger of offending the lady by protesting that he had no judgment in pictures indeed i don't pretend to be a connoisseur or connoissanti myself but i'm told the style is undeniably modern and was not i lucky juliana not to let that madonna be knocked down to me i was just going to bid when i heard such smart biddin but fortunately the auctioneer let out that it was done by a very old master a hundred years old oh you are most obedient thinks i if that's the case it's not for my money so i bought this in lieu of the smoke droid thing and had it at a bargain in architecture mrs rafferty had as good a taste and as much skill as in painting there had been a handsome portico in front of the house but this interfering with the lady's desire to have a veranda which she said could not be dispensed with she had raised the whole portico to the second story where it stood or seemed to stand upon a tarpaulin roof but mrs rafferty explained that the pillars though they looked so properly substantial were really hollow and as light as feathers and were supported with cramps without disobliging the front wall of the house at all to signify before she showed the company any farther she said she must premise to his lordship that she had been originally stinted in room for her improvements so that she could not follow her genius liberally she had been reduced to have some things on a confined scale and occasionally to consult her pocket compass but she prided herself upon having put as much into a light pattern as could well be that had been her whole ambition study and problem for she was determined to have at least the honour of having a little taste of everything at tusculum so she led the way to a little conservatory and a little pinery and a little grapery and a little aviary and a little pheasantry and a little dairy for show and a little cottage for ditto with a grotto full of shells and a little hermitage full of earwigs and a little ruin full of looking-glass to enlarge and multiply the effect of the gothic but you could only put your head in because it was just fresh painted and though there had been a fire ordered in the ruin all night it had only smoked in all mrs rafferty's buildings whether ancient or modern there was a studied crookedness yes she said she hated everything straight it was so formal and unpicturesque uniformity and conformity she observed had their day but now thank the stars of the present day irregularity and deformity bear the bell and have the majority 
as they proceeded and walked through the grounds from which mrs rafferty though she had done her best could not take that which nature had given she pointed out to my lord a happy moving termination consisting of a chinese bridge with a fisherman leaning over the rails on a sudden the fisherman was seen to tumble over the bridge into the water the gentleman ran to extricate the poor fellow while they heard mrs rafferty bawling to his lordship to beg he would never mind and not trouble himself when they arrived at the bridge they saw the man hanging from part of the bridge and apparently struggling in the water but when they attempted to pull him up they found it was only a stuffed figure which had been pulled into the stream by a real fish which had seized hold of the bait mrs rafferty vexed by the fisherman's fall and by the laughter it occasioned did not recover herself sufficiently to be happily ridiculous during the remainder of the walk nor till dinner was announced when she apologized for having changed the collation that first intended into a dinner which she hoped would be found no bad substitute and which she flattered herself might prevail on my lord and the gentleman to sleep as there was no moon the dinner had two great faults profusion and pretension there was in fact ten times more on the table than was necessary and the entertainment was far above the circumstances of the person by whom it was given for instance the dish of fish at the head of the table had been brought across the island from sligo and had cost five guineas as the lady of the house failed not to make known but after all things were not of a piece there was a disparity between the entertainment and the attendance there was no proportion or fitness of things a painful endeavour at what could not be attained and a toiling in vain to conceal and repair deficiencies and blunders had the mistress of the house been quiet had she as mrs broadhurst would say but let things alone let things take their course all would have passed off with well-bred people but she was incessantly apologizing and fussing and fretting inwardly and outwardly and directing and calling to her servants striving to make a butler who was deaf a boy who was hare-brained do the business of five accomplished footmen of parts and figure the mistress of the house called for plates clean plates hot plates but none did come when she did call for them mrs rafferty called lanty lanty my lord's plate there james bread to captain bowles james port wine to the major james james kenny james and panting james toiled after her in vain at length one course was fairly got through and after a torturing half-hour the second course appeared and james kenny was intent upon one thing and lanty upon another so that the wine sauce for the hare was spilt by their collision but what was worse there seemed little chance that the whole of this second course should ever be placed altogether rightly upon the table mrs rafferty cleared her throat and nodded and pointed and sighed and set lanty after kenny and kenny after lanty for what one did the other undid and at last the lady's anger kindled and she spoke kenny james kenny set the sea kale at this corner and put down the grass cross corners and match your macaroni yonder with them puddin's set och james the pyramid in the middle can't ye the pyramid in changing places was overturned then it was that the mistress of the feast falling back in her seat and lifting up her hands and eyes in despair ejaculated oh james james the pyramid was raised by the assistance of the military engineers and stood trembling again on its base but the lady's temper could not be so easily restored to its equilibrium the comedy of errors which this day's visit exhibited amused all the spectators but lord colambre after he had smiled sometimes sighed similar foibles and follies in persons of different rank fortune and manner appear to common observers so unlike that they laugh without scruples of conscience in one case at what in another ought to touch themselves most nearly it was the same desire to appear what they were not 
the same vain ambition to vie with superior rank and fortune or fashion which actuated lady clonbrony and mrs rafferty and whilst this ridiculous grocer's wife made herself the sport of some of her guests lord colambre sighed from the reflection that what she was to them his mother was to persons in a higher rank of fashion he sighed still more deeply when he considered that in whatever station or with whatever fortune extravagance that is the living beyond our income must lead to distress and meanness and end in shame and ruin in the morning as they were riding away from tusculum and talking over their visit the officers laughed heartily and rallying lord colambre upon his seriousness accused him of having fallen in love with mrs rafferty or with the elegant miss juliana our hero who wished never to be nice over much or serious out of season laughed with those that laughed and endeavoured to catch the spirit of the jest but sir james brooke who now was well acquainted with his countenance and who knew something of the history of his family understood his real feelings and sympathizing in them endeavoured to give the conversation a new turn look there bowles said he as they were just riding into the town of bray look at the barouche standing at that green door at the farthest end of the town is not that lady dashfort's barouche it looks like what she sported in dublin last year said bowles but you don't think she'd give us the same two seasons besides she's not in ireland is she i did not hear of her intending to come over again i beg your pardon said another officer she will come again to so good a market to marry her other daughter i heard she said or swore that she will marry the young widow lady isabel to an irish nobleman whatever she says she swears and whatever she swears she'll do replied bowles have a care my lord colambre if she sets her heart upon you for lady isabel she has you nothing can save you heart she has none so there you're safe my lord said the other officer but if lady isabel sets her eye upon you no basilisks is surer but if lady dashfort had landed i am sure we should have heard of it for she makes noise enough wherever she goes especially in dublin where all she said and did was echoed and magnified till one could hear of nothing else i don't think she has landed i hope to heaven they may never land again in ireland cried sir james brooke one worthless woman especially one worthless english woman of rank does incalculable mischief in a country like this which looks up to the sister country for fashion for my own part as a warm friend to ireland i would rather see all the toads and serpents and venomous reptiles that st patrick carried off in his bag come back to this island than these two dashers why they would bite half the women and girls in the kingdom with the rage for mischief before half the husbands and fathers could turn their heads about and once bit there's no cure in nature or art no horses to this barouche cried captain bowles pray sir whose carriage is this said the captain to a servant who was standing beside it my lady dashfort sir it belongs to answered the servant in rather a surly english tone and turning to a boy who was lounging at the door pat bid them bring out the horses for my ladies is in a hurry to get home captain bowles stopped to make his servant alter the girths of his horse and to satisfy his curiosity and the whole party halted captain bowles beckoned to the landlord of the inn who was standing at his door so lady dashfort is here again this is her barouche is not it yes sir she is it is and has she sold her fine horses oh no sir this is not her carriage at all she is not here that is she is here in ireland but down in the county of wicklow on a visit and this is not her own carriage at all that is to say not that which she has with herself driven but only just the cast barouche like as she keeps for the ladies maids for the ladies maids that is good that is new faith sir james do you hear that 
indeed then and it's true and not a word of a lie said the honest landlord and this minute we've got a directory of five of them abigails sittin within in our house as fine ladies as great dashers too every bit as their principles and kickin up as much dust on the road every grain think o them now the likes of them that must have four horses and would not stir a foot with one less as the gentleman's gentleman there was tellin and boastin to me about now when the barouche was ordered for them there at the lady's house where lady dashfort is on a visit they said they would not get in till they'd get four horses and their ladies backed them and so the four horses was got and they just drove out here to see the points of view for fashion's sake like their betters and up with their glasses like their ladies and then out with their watches and isn't it time to lunch so there they have been lunchin within on what they brought with them for nothin in our house could they touch of course they brought themselves a picnic lunch with madeira and champagne to wash it down why gentlemen what do you think but a set of them as they were braggin to me turned out of a boardin house at cheltenham last year because they had not peach pies to their lunch but here they come shawls and veils and all streamers flyin but mum is my cue captain are these girths to your fancy now said the landlord aloud then as he stooped to alter a buckle he said in a voice meant to be heard only by captain bowles if there's a tongue male or female in the three kingdoms it's in that foremost woman mrs petito mrs petito repeated lord colambre as the name caught his ear and approaching the barouche in which the five abigails were now seated he saw the identical mrs petito who when he left london had been in his mother's service she recognized his lordship with very gracious intimacy and before he had time to ask any questions she answered all she conceived he was going to ask and with a volubility which justified the landlord's eulogium of her tongue yes my lord i left my lady clonbrony some time back the day after you left town and both her ladyship and miss nugent was charmingly and would have sent their loves to your lordship i'm sure if they'd any notion i should have met you my lord so soon and i was very sorry to part with them but the fact was my lord said mrs petito laying a detaining hand upon lord colambre's whip one end of which he unwittingly trusted within her reach i and my lady had a little difference which the best friends you know sometimes have so my lady clonbrony was so condescending to give me up to my lady dashfort and i knew no more than the child unborn that her ladyship had it in contemplation to cross the seas but to oblige my lady and as colonel heathcock with his regiment of militia was coming for protection in the packet at the same time and we to have the government yacht i waived my objections to ireland and indeed though i was greatly frighted at first having heard all we've heard you know my lord from lady clonbrony of there being no living in ireland and expecting to see no trees nor accommodation nor anything but bogs all along yet i declare i was very agreeably surprised for as far as i've seen at dublin and in the vicinity the accommodations and everything of that nature now is vastly put upable with my lord said sir james brooke we shall be late lord colambre shortly withdrawing his whip from mrs petito turned his horse away she stretching over the back of the barouche as he rode off bawled to him my lord we're at stephen's green when we're at dublin but as he did not choose to hear she raised her voice to its highest pitch adding and where are you my lord to be found as i have a parcel of miss nugent's for you lord colambre instantly turned back and gave his direction cleverly done faith said the major i did not hear her say when lady dashfort is to be in town said captain bowles what bowles have you a mind to lose more of your guineas to lady dashfort and to be jockeyed out of another horse by lady isabel oh confound it no i'll keep out of the way of that i've had enough said captain bowles it is my lord colambre's turn now you hear that lady dashfort would be very proud to see him his lordship is in for it and with such an auxiliary as mrs petito 
lady dashfort has him for lady isabel as sure as he has a heart or hand my compliments to the ladies but my heart is engaged said lord colambre and my hand shall go with my heart or not at all engaged engaged to a very amiable charming woman no doubt said sir james brooke i have an excellent opinion of your taste and if you can return the compliment to my judgment take my advice don't trust to your heart's being engaged much less plead that engagement for it would be lady dashfort's sport and lady isabel's joy to make you break your engagement and break your mistress's heart the fairer the more amiable the more beloved the greater the triumph the greater the delight in giving pain all the time love would be out of the question neither mother nor daughter would care if you were hanged or as lady dashfort would herself have expressed it if you were damned with such women i should think a man's heart could be in no great danger said lord colambre there you might be mistaken my lord there's a way to every man's heart which no man in his own case is aware of but which every woman knows right well and none better than these ladies by his vanity true said captain bowles i am not so vain as to think myself without vanity said lord colambre but love i should imagine is a stronger passion than vanity you should imagine stay till you are tried my lord excuse me said captain bowles laughing lord colambre felt the good sense of this and determined to have nothing to do with these dangerous ladies indeed though he had talked he had scarcely yet thought of them for his imagination was intent upon that packet from miss nugent which mrs petito said she had for him he heard nothing of it or of her for some days he sent his servant every day to stephen's green to inquire if lady dashfort had returned to town her ladyship at last returned but mrs petito could not deliver the parcel to any hand but lord colambre's own and she would not stir out because her lady was indisposed no longer able to restrain his impatience lord colambre went himself knocked at lady dashfort's door inquired for mrs petito was shown into her parlour the parcel was delivered to him but to his utter disappointment it was a parcel for not from miss nugent it contained merely an odd volume of some book of miss nugent's which mrs petito said she had put up along with her things in a mistake and she thought it her duty to return it by the next opportunity of a safe conveyance whilst lord colambre to comfort himself for his disappointment was fixing his eyes upon miss nugent's name written by her own hand in the first leaf of the book the door opened and the figure of an interesting-looking woman in deep mourning appeared appeared for one moment and retired only my lord colambre about a parcel i was bringing for him from england my lady my lady isabel my lord said mrs petito whilst mrs petito was saying this the entrance and retreat had been made and made with such dignity grace and modesty with such innocence dove-like eyes had been raised upon him fixed and withdrawn with such a gracious bend the lady isabel had bowed to him as she retired with such a smile and with so soft a voice had repeated lord colambre that his lordship though well aware that all this was mere acting could not help saying to himself as he left the house it is a pity it is only acting there is certainly something very engaging in this woman it is a pity she is an actress and so young a much younger woman than i expected a widow before most women are wives so young surely she cannot be such a fiend as they described her to be a few nights afterwards lord colambre was with some of his acquaintance at the theatre when lady isabel and her mother came into the box where seats had been reserved for them and where their appearance instantly made that sensation which is usually created by the entrance of persons of the first notoriety in the fashionable world lord colambre was not a man to be dazzled by fashion 
or to mistake notoriety for deference paid to merit and for the admiration commanded by beauty or talents lady dashfort's coarse person loud voice daring manners and indelicate wit disgusted him almost past endurance he saw sir james brooke in the box opposite to him and twice determined to go round to him his lordship had crossed the benches and once his hand was upon the lock of the door but attracted as much by the daughter as repelled by the mother he could move no farther the mother's masculine boldness heightened by contrast the charms of the daughter's soft sentimentality the lady isabel seemed to shrink from the indelicacy of her mother's manners and seemed peculiarly distressed by the strange efforts lady dashfort made from time to time to drag her forward and to fix upon her the attention of gentlemen colonel heathcock who as mrs petito had informed lord colambre had come over with his regiment to ireland was beckoned into their box by lady dashfort by her squeezed into a seat next to lady isabel but lady isabel seemed to feel sovereign contempt properly repressed by politeness for what in a low whisper to a female friend on the other side of her she called the self-sufficient inanity of this sad coxcomb other coxcombs of a more vivacious style who stationed themselves round her mother or to whom her mother stretched from box to box to talk seemed to engage no more of lady isabel's attention than just what she was compelled to give by lady dashfort's repeated calls of isabel isabel colonel g isabel lord d bowing to you bell bell sir harry b isabel child with your eyes on the stage did you never see a play before novice major p waiting to catch your eye this quarter of an hour and now her eyes gone down to her playbill sir harry do take it from her were eyes so radiant only made to read lady isabel appeared to suffer so exquisitely and so naturally from this persecution that lord colambre said to himself if this be acting it is the best acting i ever saw if this be art it deserves to be nature and with this sentiment he did himself the honour of handing lady isabel to her carriage this night and with this sentiment he awoke next morning and by the time he had dressed and breakfasted he determined that it was impossible all that he had seen could be acting no woman no young woman could have such art sir james brooke had been unwarrantably severe he would go and tell him so but sir james brooke this day received orders for his regiment to march to quarters in a distant part of ireland his head was full of arms and ammunition and knapsacks and billets and brutes and there was no possibility even in the present chivalrous disposition of our hero to enter upon the defence of the lady isabel indeed in the regret he felt for the approaching and unexpected departure of his friend lord colambre forgot the fair lady but just when sir james had his foot in the stirrup he stopped by the by my dear lord i saw you at the play last night you seemed to be much interested don't think me impertinent if i remind you of our conversation when we were riding home from tusculum and if i warn you said he mounting his horse to beware of counterfeits for such are abroad reining in his impatient steed sir james turned again and added deeds not words is my motto remember we can judge better by the conduct of people towards others than by their manner towards ourselves end of chapter six chapter seven of the absentee by maria edgeworth this librivox recording is in the public domain our hero was quite convinced of the good sense of his friend's last remark that it is safer to judge of people by their conduct to others than by their manners towards ourselves but as yet he felt scarcely any interest on the subject of lady dashfort or lady isabel's characters 
however he inquired and listened to all the evidence he could obtain respecting this mother and daughter he heard terrible reports of the mischief they had done in families the extravagance into which they had led men the imprudence to say no worse into which they had betrayed women matches broken off reputations ruined husbands alienated from their wives and wives made jealous of their husbands but in some of these stories he discovered exaggeration so flagrant as to make him doubt the whole in others it could not be positively determined whether the mother or daughter had been the person most to blame lord colambre always followed the charitable rule of believing only half what the world says and here he thought it fair to believe which half he pleased he further observed that though all joined in abusing these ladies in their absence when present they seemed universally admired though everybody cried shame and shocking yet everybody visited them no parties so crowded as lady dashfort's no party deemed pleasant or fashionable where lady dashfort or lady isabel was not the bon mots of the mother were everywhere repeated the dress and air of the daughter everywhere imitated yet lord colambre could not help being surprised at their popularity in dublin because independently of all moral objections there were causes of a different sort sufficient he thought to prevent lady dashfort from being liked by the irish indeed by any society she in general affected to be ill-bred and inattentive to the feelings and opinions of others careless whom she offended by her wit or by her decided tone there are some persons in so high a region of fashion that they imagine themselves above the thunder of vulgar censure lady dashfort felt herself in this exalted situation and fancied she might hear the innocuous thunder roll below her rank was so high that none could dare to call her vulgar what would have been gross in any one of meaner note in her was freedom or originality or lady dashfort's way it was lady dashfort's pleasure and pride to show her power in perverting the public taste she often said to those english companions with whom she was intimate now see what follies i can lead these fools into hear the nonsense i can make them repeat as wit upon some occasion one of her friends ventured to fear that something she had said was too strong too strong was it well i like to be strong woe be to the weak on another occasion she was told that certain visitors had seen her ladyship yawning yawn did i glad of it the yawn sent them away or i should have snored rude was i they won't complain to say i was rude to them would be to say that i did not think it worth my while to be otherwise barbarians are not we the civilized english come to teach them manners and fashions whoever does not conform and swear allegiance to we shall keep out of the english pale lady dashfort forced her way and she set the fashion fashion which converts the ugliest dress into what is beautiful and charming governs the public mode in morals and in manners and thus when great talents and high rank combine they can debase or elevate the public taste with lord colambre she played more artfully she drew him out in defence of his beloved country and gave him opportunities of appearing to advantage this he could not help feeling especially when the lady isabel was present lady dashfort had dealt long enough with human nature to know that to make any man pleased with her she should begin by making him pleased with himself insensibly the antipathy that lord colambre had originally felt to lady dashfort wore off her faults he began to think were assumed he pardoned her defiance of good breeding when he observed that she could when she chose it be most engagingly polite it was not that she did not know what was right but that she did not think it always for her interest to practise it the party opposed to lady dashfort affirmed that her wit depended merely on unexpectedness 
a characteristic which may be applied to any impropriety of speech manner or conduct in some of her ladyship's repartees however lord colambre now acknowledged there was more than unexpectedness there was real wit but it was of a sort utterly unfit for a woman and he was sorry that lady isabel should hear it in short exceptionable as it was altogether lady dashfort's conversation had become entertaining to him and though he could never esteem or feel in the least interested about her he began to allow that she could be agreeable ay i knew how it would be said she when some of her friends told her this he began by detesting me and did i not tell you that if i thought it worth my while to make him like me he must sooner or later i delight in seeing people begin with me as they do with olives making all manner of horrid faces and silly protestations that they will never touch an olive again as long as they live but after a little time these very folk grow so desperately fond of olives that there is no dessert without them isabel child you are in the sweet line but sweets cloy you never heard of anybody living on marmalade did ye lady isabel answered by a sweet smile to do you justice you play lydia languish vastly well pursued the mother but lydia by herself would soon tire somebody must keep up the spirit and bustle and carry on the plot of the piece and i am that somebody as you shall see is not that our hero's voice which i hear on the stairs it was lord colambre his lordship had by this time become a constant visitor at lady dashfort's not that he had forgotten or that he meant to disregard his friend sir james brooke's parting words he promised himself faithfully that if anything should occur to give him reason to suspect designs such as those to which the warning pointed he would be on his guard and would prove his generalship by an able retreat but to imagine attacks where none were attempted to suspect ambuscades in the open country would be ridiculous and cowardly no thought our hero heaven forfend i should be such a coxcomb as to fancy every woman who speaks to me has designs upon my precious heart or on my more precious estate as he walked from his hotel to lady dashfort's house ingeniously wrong he came to this conclusion just as he ascended the stairs and just as her ladyship had settled her future plan of operations after talking over the nothings of the day and after having given two or three cuts at the society of dublin with two or three compliments to individuals who she knew were favourites with his lordship she suddenly turned to him my lord i think you told me or my own sagacity discovered that you want to see something of ireland and that you don't intend like most travellers to turn round see nothing and go home content lord colambre assured her ladyship that she had judged him rightly for that nothing would content him but seeing all that was possible to be seen of his native country it was for this special purpose he came to ireland ah well very good purpose can't be better but now how to accomplish it you know the portuguese proverb says you go to hell for the good things you intend to do and to heaven for those you do now let us see what you will do dublin i suppose you've seen enough of by this time through and through round and round this makes me first giddy and then sick let me show you the country not the face of it but the body of it the people not castle this or newtown that but their inhabitants i know them i have the key or the picklock to their minds an irishman is as different an animal on his guard and off his guard as a miss in school from a miss out of school a fine country for game i'll show you and if you are a good marksman you may have plenty of shots at folly as it flies lord colambre smiled 
as to isabel pursued her ladyship i shall put her in charge of heathcock who is going with us she won't thank me for that but you will nay no fibs man you know i know as who does not that has seen the world that though a pretty woman is a mighty pretty thing yet she is confoundedly in one's way when anything else is to be seen heard or understood every objection anticipated and removed and so far a prospect held out of attaining all the information he desired with more than all the amusement he could have expected lord colambre seemed much tempted to accept the invitation but he hesitated because as he said her ladyship might be going to pay visits where he was not acquainted bless you don't let that be a stumbling block in the way of your tender conscience i am going to kilpatrick's town where you'll be as welcome as light you know them they know you at least you shall have a proper letter of invitation from my lord and my lady kilpatrick and all that and as to the rest you know a young man is always welcome everywhere a young nobleman kindly welcome i won't say such a young man and such a young nobleman for that might put you to your bows or your blushes but nobilitas by itself nobility is enough in all parties in all families where there are girls and of course balls as there are always at kilpatrick's town don't be alarmed you shall not be forced to dance or asked to marry i'll be your security you shall be at full liberty and it is a house where you can do just what you will indeed i go to no others these kilpatricks are the best creatures in the world they think nothing good or grand enough for me if i let them they would lay down cloth of gold over their bogs for me to walk upon good-hearted beings added lady dashfort marking a cloud gathering on lord colambre's countenance i laugh at them because i love them i could not love anything i might not laugh at your lordship excepted so you'll come that's settled and so it was settled our hero went to kilpatrick's town everything here sumptuous and unfinished you see said lady dashfort to lord colambre the day after their arrival all begun as if the projectors thought they had the command of the mines of peru and ended as if the possessors had not sixpence des arrangements provisatoires temporary expedients in plain english makeshifts luxuries enough for an english prince of the blood comforts not enough for an english woman and you may be sure that great repairs and alterations have gone on to fit this house for our reception and for our english eyes poor people english visitors in this point of view are horribly expensive to the irish did you ever hear that in the last century or in the century before the last to put my story far enough back so that it shall not touch anybody living when a certain english nobleman lord a sent to let his irish friend lord blank b know that he and all his train were coming over to pay him a visit the irish nobleman blank b knowing the deplorable condition of his castle sat down fairly to calculate whether it would cost him most to put the building in good and sufficient repair fit to receive these english visitors or to burn it to the ground he found the balance to be in favour of burning which was wisely accomplished next day perhaps kilpatrick would have done well to follow this example resolve me which is worst to be burnt out of house and home or to be eaten out of house and home in this house above and below stairs including first and second table housekeeper's room lady's maid's room butler's room and gentlemen's one hundred and four people sit down to dinner every day as petito informs me beside kitchen boys and what they call charwomen who never sit down but who do not eat or waste the less for that and retainers and friends friends to the fifth and sixth generation who must get their bit and their sup for sure it's only biddy they say continued lady dashfort imitating their irish brogue and sure tis nothing at all out of all his honour my lord has how could he feel it 
long life to him he's not that way not a couple in all ireland and that's saying a great deal looks less after their own nor is more off-handeder or open-hearteder or greater open housekeepers nor my lord and my lady kilpatrick now there's encouragement for a lord and a lady to ruin themselves lady dashfort imitated the irish brogue in perfection boasted that she was mistress of fourteen different brogues and had brogues for all occasions by her mixture of mimicry sarcasm exaggeration and truth she succeeded continually in making lord colambre laugh at everything at which she wished to make him laugh at every thing but not everybody whenever she became personal he became serious or at least endeavoured to become serious and if he could not instantly resume the command of his risible muscles he reproached himself it is shameful to laugh at these people indeed lady dashfort in their own house these hospitable people who are entertaining us entertaining us true and if we are entertained how can we help laughing all expostulation was thus turned off by a jest as it was her pride to make lord colambre laugh in spite of his better feelings and principles this he saw and this seemed to him to be her sole object but there he was mistaken off-handed as she pretended to be none dealt more in the impromptu fête loisir and mentally short-sighted as she affected to be none had more longanimity for their own interest it was her settled purpose to make the irish and ireland ridiculous and contemptible to lord colambre to disgust him with his native country to make him abandon the wish of residing on his own estate to confirm him an absentee was her object previously to her ultimate plan of marrying him to her daughter her daughter was poor she would therefore be glad to get an irish peer for her but would be very sorry she said to see isabel banished to ireland and the young widow declared she could never bring herself to be buried alive in clonbrony castle in addition to these considerations lady dashfort received certain hints from mrs petito which worked all to the same point why yes my lady i heard a great deal about all that when i was at lady clonbrony's said petito one day as she was attending at her lady's toilette and encouraged to begin chattering and i own i was originally under the universal error that my lord colambre was to be married to the great heiress miss broadhurst but i have been converted and reformed on that score and am at present quite in another way and style of thinking petito paused in hopes that her lady would ask what was her present way of thinking but lady dashfort certain that she would tell her without being asked did not take the trouble to speak particularly as she did not choose to appear violently interested on the subject my present way of thinking resumed petito is in consequence of my having with my own eyes and ears witnessed and overheard his lordship's behaviour and words the morning he was coming away from london for ireland when he was morally certain nobody was up nor overhearing nor overseeing him there did i notice him my lady stopping in the antechamber ejaculating over one of miss nugent's gloves which he had picked up limerick said he quite loud to himself for it was a limerick glove my lady limerick dear ireland she loves you as well as i do or words to that effect and then a sigh and downstairs and off so thinks i now the cat's out of the bag and i wouldn't give much myself for miss broadhurst's chance of that young lord with all her bank stock scrip and omnum now i see how the land lies and i'm sorry for it for she's no fortin and she's so proud she never said a hint to me of the matter but my lord colambre is a sweet gentleman and petito don't run on so you must not meddle with what you don't understand the miss kilpatricks to be sure are sweet girls particularly the youngest her ladyship's toilette was finished 
and she left petito to go down to my lady kilpatrick's woman to tell as a very great secret the schemes that were in contemplation among the higher powers in favour of the youngest of the miss kilpatrick's so ireland is at the bottom of his heart is it repeated lady dashfort to herself it shall not be long so from this time forward not a day scarcely an hour passed but her ladyship did or said something to depreciate the country or its inhabitants in our hero's estimation with treacherous ability she knew and followed all the arts of misrepresentation all those injurious arts which his friend sir james brooke had with such honest indignation reprobated she knew how not only to seize the ridiculous points to make the most respectable people ridiculous but she knew how to select the worst instances the worst exceptions and to produce them as examples as precedents from which to condemn whole classes and establish general false conclusions respecting a nation in the neighbourhood of kilpatrick's town lady dashfort said there were several squireens or little squires a race of men who have succeeded to the buckeens described by young and crump squireens are persons who with good long leases or valuable farms possess incomes from three to eight hundred a year who keep a pack of hounds take out a commission of the peace sometimes before they can spell as her ladyship said and almost always before they know anything of law or justice busy and loud about small matters jobbers at assizes combining with one another and trying upon every occasion public or private to push themselves forward to the annoyance of their superiors and the terror of those below them in the usual course of things these men are not often to be found in the society of gentry except perhaps among those gentlemen or noblemen who like to see hangers-on at their tables or who find it for their convenience to have underling magistrates to protect their favourites or to propose and carry jobs for them on grand juries at election times however these persons rise into sudden importance with all who have views upon the county lady dashfort hinted to lord kilpatrick that her private letters from england spoke of an approaching dissolution of parliament she knew that upon this hint a round of invitations would be sent to the squireens and she was morally certain that they would be more disagreeable to lord colambre and give him a worse idea of the country than any other people who could be produced day after day some of these personages made their appearance and lady dashfort took care to draw them out upon the subjects on which she knew that they would show the most self-sufficient ignorance and the most illiberal spirit this succeeded beyond her most sanguine expectations lord colambre how i pity you for being compelled to these permanent sittings after dinner said lady isabel to him one night when he came late to the ladies from the dining-room lord kilpatrick insisted upon my staying to help him to push about that never-ending still beginning electioneering bottle said lord colambre oh if that were all if these gentlemen would only drink but their conversation i don't wonder my mother dreads returning to clonbrony castle if my father must have such company as this but surely it cannot be necessary oh indispensable positively indispensable cried lady dashfort no living in ireland without it you know in every country in the world you must live with the people of the country or be torn to pieces for my part i should prefer being torn to pieces lady dashfort and lady isabel knew how to take advantage of the contrast between their own conversation and that of the persons by whom lord colambre was so justly disgusted they happily relieved his fatigue with wit satire poetry and sentiment so that he every day became more exclusively fond of their company for lady kilpatrick and the miss kilpatricks were mere commonplace people in the mornings he rode or walked with lady dashfort and lady isabel 
lady dashfort by way of fulfilling her promise of showing him the people used frequently to take him into the cabins and talk to their inhabitants lord and lady kilpatrick who had lived always for the fashionable world had taken little pains to improve the condition of their tenants the few attempts they had made were injudicious they had built ornamented picturesque cottages within view of their domain and favorite followers of the family people with half a century's habit of indolence and dirt were promoted to these fine dwellings the consequences were such as lady dashfort delighted to point out everything let to go to ruin for the want of a moment's care or pulled to pieces for the sake of the most trifling surreptitious profit the people most assisted always appearing proportionally wretched and discontented no one could with more ease and more knowledge of her ground than lady dashfort do the dishonour of a country in every cabin that she entered by the first glance of her eye at the head kerchiefed in no comely guise or by the drawn-down corners of the mouth or by the bit of a broken pipe which in ireland never characterizes stout labour or by the first sound of the voice the drawling accent on your honour or my lady she could distinguish the proper objects of her charitable designs that is to say those of the old uneducated race whom no one can help because they will never help themselves to these she constantly addressed herself making them give in all their despairing tones a history of their complaints and grievances then asking them questions aptly contrived to expose their habits of self-contradiction their servility and flattery one moment and their litigious and encroaching spirit the next thus giving lord colambre the most unfavourable idea of the disposition and character of the lower class of the irish people lady isabel the while standing by with the most amiable air of pity with expressions of the finest moral sensibility softening all her mother said finding ever some excuse for the poor creatures and following with angelic sweetness to heal the wounds her mother inflicted when lady dashfort thought she had sufficiently worked upon lord colambre's mind to weaken his enthusiasm for his native country and when lady isabel had by the appearance of every virtue added to a delicate preference if not partiality for our hero ingratiated herself into his good opinion and obtained an interest in his mind the wily mother ventured an attack of a more decisive nature and so contrived it was that if it failed it should appear to have been made without design to injure and in total ignorance one day lady dashfort who in fact was not proud of her family though she pretended to be so had herself prevailed on though with much difficulty by lady kilpatrick to do the very thing she wanted to do to show her genealogy which had been beautifully blazoned and which was to be produced as evidence in the lawsuit that brought her to ireland lord colambre stood politely looking on and listening while her ladyship explained the splendid intermarriages of her family pointing to each medallion that was filled gloriously with noble and even with royal names till at last she stopped short and covering one medallion with her finger she said pass over that dear lady kilpatrick you are not to see that lord colambre that's a little blot in our scutcheon you know isabel we never talk of that prudent match of great uncle john's what could he expect by marrying into that family where you know all the men were not sans pair and none of the women sans reproche oh mamma cried lady isabel not one exception not one isabel persisted lady dashfort there was lady blank and the other sister that married the man with the long nose and the daughter again of whom they contrived to make an honest woman by getting her married in time to a blue ribbon and who contrived to get herself into doctor's commons the very next year 
well dear mamma that is enough and too much oh pray don't go on cried lady isabel who had appeared very much distressed during her mother's speech you don't know what you are saying indeed ma'am you don't very likely child but that compliment i can return to you on the spot and with interest for you seem to me at this instant not to know either what you are saying or what you are doing come come explain oh no ma'am pray say so no more i will explain myself another time nay there you are wrong isabel in point of good breeding anything is better than hints and mystery since i have been so unlucky as to touch upon the subject better go through with it and with all the boldness of innocence ask the question are you my lord colambre or are you not related or connected with any of the st omars not that i know of said lord colambre but i really am so bad a genealogist that i cannot answer positively then i must put the substance of my question into a new form have you or have you not a cousin of the name of nugent miss nugent grace nugent yes said lord colambre with as much firmness of voice as he could command and with as little change of countenance as possible but as the question came upon him so unexpectedly it was not in his power to answer with an air of absolute indifference and composure and her mother was said lady dashfort my aunt by marriage her maiden name was reynolds i think but she died when i was quite a child i know very little about her i never saw her in my life but i am certain she was a reynolds oh my dear lord continued lady dashfort i am perfectly aware that she did take and bear the name of reynolds but that was not her maiden name her maiden name was but perhaps it is a family secret that has been kept for some good reason from you and from the poor girl herself the maiden name was st omar depend upon it nay i would not have told this to you my lord if i could have conceived that it would affect you so violently pursued lady dashfort in a tone of raillery you see you are no worse off than we are we have an intermarriage with the st omars i did not think you would be so much shocked at a discovery which proves that our family and yours have some little connection lord colambre endeavoured to answer and mechanically said something about happy to have the honour lady dashfort truly happy to see that her blow had hit the mark so well turned from his lordship without seeming to observe how seriously he was affected and lady isabel sighed and looked with compassion on lord colambre and then reproachfully at her mother but lord colambre heeded not her looks and heard not of her sighs he heard nothing saw nothing though his eyes were intently fixed on the genealogy on which lady dashfort was still descanting to lady kilpatrick he took the first opportunity he could of quitting the room and went out to take a solitary walk there he is departed but not in peace to reflect upon what has been said whispered lady dashfort to her daughter i hope it will do him a vast deal of good none of the women sans reproche none without one exception said lord colambre to himself and grace nugent's mother a saint omar is it possible lady dashfort seems certain she could not assert a positive falsehood no motive she does not know that miss nugent is the person to whom i am attached she spoke at random and i have heard it first from a stranger not from my mother why was it kept secret from me now i understand the reason why my mother evidently never wished that i should think of miss nugent why she always spoke so vehemently against the marriages of relations of cousins why not tell me the truth it would have had the strongest effect had she known my mind lord colambre had the greatest dread of marrying any woman whose mother had conducted herself ill his reason his prejudices his pride his delicacy and even his limited experience were all against it 
all his hopes his plans of future happiness were shaken to their very foundation he felt as if he had received a blow that stunned his mind and from which he could not recover his faculties the whole of that day he was like one in a dream at night the painful idea continually recurred to him and whenever he was falling asleep the sound of lady dashfort's voice returned upon his ear saying the words what could he expect when he married one of the saint omars none of the women sans reproche in the morning he rose early and the first thing he did was to write a letter to his mother requesting unless there was some important reason for her declining to answer the question that she would immediately relieve his mind from a great uneasiness he altered the word four times but at last left it uneasiness he stated what he had heard and besought his mother to tell him the whole truth without reserve End of chapter seven chapter eight of the absentee by maria edgeworth this librivox recording is in the public domain one morning lady dashfort had formed an ingenious scheme for leaving lady isabel and lord colambre tete-a-tete -tete. but the sudden entrance of heathcock disconcerted her intentions he came to beg lady dashfort's interest with count o'halloran for permission to hunt and shoot on his grounds not for myself pon honour but for two officers who are quartered at the next town here who will indubitably hang or drown themselves if they are debarred from sporting who is this count o'halloran said lord colambre miss white lady kilpatrick's companion said he was a great oddity lady dashfort that he was singular and the clergyman of the parish who was at breakfast declared that he was a man of uncommon knowledge merit and politeness all i know of him said heathcock is that he is a great sportsman with a long queue a gold-laced hat and long skirts to a laced waistcoat lord colambre expressed a wish to see this extraordinary personage and lady dashfort to cover her former design and perhaps thinking absence might be as effectual as too much propinquity immediately offered to call upon the officers in their way and carry them with heathcock and lord colambre to halloran castle lady isabel retired with much mortification but with becoming grace and major benson and captain williamson were taken to the counts major benson who was a famous whip took his seat on the box of the barouche and the rest of the party had the pleasure of her ladyship's conversation for three or four miles of her ladyship's conversation for lord colambre's thoughts were far distant captain williamson had not anything to say and heathcock nothing but eh, really now pon honour they arrived at halloran castle a fine old building part of it in ruins and part repaired with great judgment and taste when the carriage stopped a respectable-looking manservant appeared on the steps at the open hall door count o'halloran was out a hunting but his servant said that he would be at home immediately if lady dashfort and the gentleman would be pleased to walk in on one side of the lofty and spacious hall stood the skeleton of an elk on the other the perfect skeleton of a moose deer which as the servant said his master had made out with great care from the different bones of many of this curious species of deer found in the lakes in the neighbourhood the brace of officers witnessed their wonder with sundry strange oaths and exclamations eh, pon honour really now said heathcock and too genteel to wonder at or admire anything in the creation dragged out his watch with some difficulty saying i wonder now whether they are likely to think of giving us anything to eat in this place and turning his back upon the moose deer he straight walked out again upon the steps called to his groom and began to make some inquiry about his led horse lord colambre surveyed the prodigious skeletons with rational curiosity and with that sense of awe and admiration by which a superior mind is always struck 
on beholding any of the great works of providence come my dear lord said lady dashfort with our sublime sensations we are keeping my old friend mr ulick brady this venerable person waiting to show us into the reception-room the servant bowed respectfully more respectfully than servants of modern date my lady the reception-room has been lately painted the smell of paint may be disagreeable with your leave i will take the liberty of showing you into my master's study he opened the door went in before her and stood holding up his finger as if making a signal of silence to some one within her ladyship entered and found herself in the midst of an odd assembly an eagle a goat a dog an otter several gold and silver fish in a glass globe and a white mouse in a cage the eagle quick of eye but quiet of demeanour was perched upon his stand the otter lay under the table perfectly harmless the angora goat a beautiful and remarkably little creature of its kind with long curling silky hair was walking about the room with the air of a beauty and a favourite the dog a tall irish greyhound one of the few of that fine race which is now almost extinct had been given to count o'halloran by an irish nobleman a relation of lady dashfort's this dog who had formerly known her ladyship looked at her with ears erect recognized her and went to meet her the moment she entered the servant answered for the peaceable behaviour of all the rest of the company of animals and retired lady dashfort began to feed the eagle from a silver plate on his stand lord colambre examined the inscription on his collar the other men stood in amaze heathcock who came in last astonished out of his constant eh, really now the moment he put himself in at the door exclaimed zounds what's all this live lumber and he stumbled over the goat who was at that moment crossing the way the colonel's spur caught in the goat's curly beard the colonel shook his foot and entangled the spur worse and worse the goat struggled and butted the colonel skated forward on the polished oak floor balancing himself with outstretched arms the indignant eagle screamed and passing by perched on heathcock's shoulders too well bred to have recourse to the terrors of his beak he scrupled not to scream and flap his wings about the colonel's ears lady dashfort the while threw herself back in her chair laughing and begging heathcock's pardon oh take care of the dog my dear colonel cried she for this kind of dog seizes his enemy by the back and shakes him to death the officers holding their sides laughed and begged no pardon while lord colambre the only person who was not absolutely incapacitated tried to disentangle the spur and to liberate the colonel from the goat and the goat from the colonel an attempt in which he at last succeeded at the expense of a considerable portion of the goat's beard the eagle however still kept his place and yet mindful of the wrongs of his insulted friend the goat had stretched his wings to give another buffet count o'halloran entered and the bird quitting his prey flew down to greet his master the count was a fine old military-looking gentleman fresh from the chase his hunting accoutrements hanging carelessly about him he advanced unembarrassed to the lady and received his other guests with a mixture of military ease and gentlemanlike dignity without adverting to the awkward and ridiculous situation in which he had found poor heathcock he apologized in general for his troublesome favorites for one of them said he patting the head of the dog which lay quiet at lady dashfort's feet i see i have no need to apologize he is where he ought to be poor fellow he has never lost his taste for the good company to which he was early accustomed as to the rest said he turning to lady dashfort a mouse a bird and a fish are you know tribute from earth air and water for my conqueror but from no barbarous civian said lord colambre smiling the count looked at lord colambre as at a person worthy his attention but his first care was to keep the peace between his loving subjects and his foreign visitors 
it was difficult to dislodge the old settlers to make room for the newcomers but he adjusted these things with admirable facility and with a master's hand and master's eye compelled each favorite to retreat into the back settlements with becoming attention he stroked and kept quiet old victory his eagle who eyed colonel heathcock still as if he did not like him and whom the colonel eyed as if he wished his neck fairly wrung off the little goat had nestled himself close up to his liberator lord colambre and lay perfectly quiet with his eyes closed going very wisely to sleep and submitting philosophically to the loss of one half of his beard conversation now commenced and was carried on by count o'halloran with much ability and spirit and with such quickness of discrimination and delicacy of taste as quite surprised and delighted our hero to the lady the count's attention was first directed he listened to her as she spoke bending with an air of deference and devotion she made her request for permission for major benson and captain williamson to hunt and shoot in his grounds this was instantly granted her ladyship's requests were to him commands the count said his gamekeeper should be instructed to give the gentlemen her friends every liberty and all possible assistance then turning to the officers he said he had just heard that several regiments of english militia had lately landed in ireland that one regiment was arrived at kilpatrick's town he rejoiced in the advantages ireland and he hoped he might be permitted to add england would probably derive from the exchange of the militia of both countries habits would be improved ideas enlarged the two countries have the same interest and from the inhabitants discovering more of each other's good qualities and interchanging little good offices in common life their esteem and affection for each other would increase and rest upon the firm basis of mutual utility to all this major benson and captain williamson made no reply the major looks so like a stuffed man of straw whispered lady dashfort to lord colambre and the captain so like the knave of clubs putting forth one manly leg count o'halloran now turned the conversation to field sports and then the captain and major opened at once pray now sir said the major you fox-hunt in this country i suppose and now do you manage the thing here as we do overnight you know before the hunt when the fox is out stopping up the earths of the cover we mean to draw and all the rest for four miles round next morning we assemble at the cover's side and the huntsman throws in the hounds the gossip here is no small part of the entertainment but as soon as we hear the hounds give tongue the favourite hounds interposed williamson the favourite hounds to be sure continued benson there is a dead silence till pug is well out of cover and the whole pack well in then shear the hounds with tally-ho till your lungs crack away he goes in gallant style and the whole field is hard up till pug takes a stiff country then they who haven't pluck lag see no more of him and with a fine blazing scent there are but few of us in at the death well we are fairly in at the death i hope said lady dashfort i was thrown out sadly at one time in the chase lord colambre with the count's permission took up a book in which the count's pencil lay paisley on the military policy of great britain it was marked with many notes of admiration and with hands pointing to remarkable passages that is a book that leaves a strong impression on the mind said the count lord colambre read one of the marked passages beginning with all that distinguishes a soldier in outward appearance from a citizen is so trifling but at this instant our hero's attention was distracted by seeing in a black-letter book this title of a chapter burial place of the nugents pray now sir said captain williamson if i don't interrupt you as you are such a famous fox-hunter maybe you may be a fisherman too and now in ireland do you mr a smart pinch on his elbow from his major who stood behind him stopped the captain short as he pronounced the word mr 
like all awkward people he turned directly to ask by his looks what was the matter the major took advantage of his discomfiture and stepping before him determined to have the fishing to himself and went on with count o'halloran i presume you understand fishing too as well as hunting the count bowed i do not presume to say that sir but pray count in this country do you arm your hook this ways give me leave taking the whip from williamson's reluctant hand this ways laying the outermost part of your feather this fashion next to your hook and the point next to your shank this wise and that wise and then sir count you take the hackle of a cock's neck a plover's topping's better said williamson and work your gold and silver thread pursued benson up to your wings and when your head's made you fasten all but you never showed how your head's made interrupted williamson the gentleman knows how a head's made any man can make a head i suppose so sir you fasten all you'll never get your head fast on that way while the world stands cried williamson fast enough for all purposes i'll bet you a rump and dozen captain and then sir count you divide your wings with a needle a pin's point will do said williamson the count to reconcile matters produced from an indian cabinet which he had opened for the lady's inspection a little basket containing a variety of artificial flies of curious construction which as he spread them on the table made williamson and benson's eyes almost sparkle with delight there was the dun fly for the month of march and the stone fly much in vogue for april and the ruddy fly of red wool black silk and red capons feathers lord colambre whose head was in the burial place of the nugents wished them all at the bottom of the sea and the green fly and the moorish fly cried benson snatching them up with transport and chief the sad yellow fly in which the fish delight in june the sad yellow fly made with the buzzard's wings bound with black braked hemp and the shell fly for the middle of july made of greenish wool wrapped about with the hurl of a peacock's tail famous for creating excellent sport all these and more were spread upon the table before the sportsman's wondering eyes capital flies capital faith cried williamson treasures faith real treasures by god cried benson eh pon honour really now were the first words which heathcock had uttered since his battle with the goat my dear heathcock are you alive still said lady dashfort i had really forgotten your existence so had count o'halloran but he did not say so your ladyship has the advantage of me there said heathcock stretching himself i wish i could forget my existence for in my mind existence is a horrible bore i thought you was a sportsman said williamson well sir and a fisherman well sir why look you there sir pointing to the flies and tell a body life's a bore one can't always fish or shoot i apprehend sir said heathcock not always but sometimes said williamson laughing for i suspect shrewdly you've forgot some of your sporting in bond street eh, pon honour really now said the colonel retreating again to his safe entrenchment of affectation from which he never could venture without imminent danger pon honour cried lady dashfort i can swear for heathcock that i have eaten excellent hares and ducks of his shooting which to my knowledge added she in a loud whisper he bought in the market emptum apram said lord colambre to the count without danger of being understood by those whom it concerned the count smiled a second time but politely turning the attention of the company from the unfortunate colonel by addressing himself to the laughing sportsmen gentlemen you seem to value these said he sweeping the artificial flies from the table into the little basket from which they had been taken 
would you do me the honour to accept of them they are all of my own making and consequently of irish manufacture then ringing the bell he asked lady dashfort's permission to have the basket put into her carriage benson and williamson followed the servant to prevent them from being tossed into the boot heathcock stood still in the middle of the room taking snuff count o'halloran turned from him to lord colambre who had just got happily to the burial place of the nugents when lady dashfort coming between them and spying the title of the chapter exclaimed what have you there antiquities my delight but i never look at engravings when i can see realities lord colambre was then compelled to follow as she led the way into the hall where the count took down golden ornaments and brass-headed spears and jointed horns of curious workmanship that had been found on his estate and he told of spermaceti wrapped in carpets and he showed small urns and closing ashes and from among these urns he selected one which he put into the hands of lord colambre telling him that it had been lately found in an old abbey ground in his neighbourhood which had been the burial place of some of the nugent family i was just looking at the account of it in the book which you saw opened on my table and as you seem to take an interest in that family my lord perhaps said the count you may think this urn worth your acceptance lord colambre said it would be highly valuable to him as the nugents were his near relations lady dashfort little expected this blow she however carried him off to the moose deer and from moose deer to round towers to various architectural antiquities and to the real and fabulous history of ireland on all which the count spoke with learning and enthusiasm but now to colonel heathcock's great joy and relief a handsome collation appeared in the dining-room of which ulick opened the folding doors count you have made an excellent house of your castle said lady dashfort it will be when it is finished said the count i am afraid added he smiling i live like many other irish gentlemen who never are but always to be blessed with a good house i began on too large a scale and can never hope to live to finish it pon honour here's a good thing which i hope we shall live to finish said heathcock sitting down before the collation and heartily did he eat of grouse pie and of irish ortolans which as lady dashfort observed afforded him indemnity for the past and security for the future eh, really now your irish ortolans are famous good eating said heathcock worth being quartered in ireland faith to taste them said benson the count recommended to lady dashfort some of that delicate sweetmeat the irish plum bless me sir count cried williamson it's by far the best thing of the kind i ever tasted in all my life where could you get this in dublin at my dear mrs godey's where only in his majesty's dominions it is to be had said the count the whole dish vanished in a few seconds pon honour i do believe this is the thing the queen's so fond of said heathcock then heartily did he drink of the count's excellent hungarian wines and by the common bond of sympathy between those who have no other tastes but eating and drinking the colonel the major and the captain were now all the best companions possible for one another whilst they prolonged the rich repast lady dashfort and lord colambre went to the window to admire the prospect lady dashfort asked the count the name of some distant hill ah said the count that hill was once covered with fine wood but it was all cut down two years ago who could have been so cruel said her ladyship i forget the present proprietor's name said the count but he is one of those who according to the clause of distress in their leases lead drive and carry away but never enter their lands one of those enemies to ireland these cruel absentees lady dashfort looked through her glass at the mountain 
lord colambre sighed and endeavouring to pass it off with a smile said frankly to the count you are not aware i am sure count that you are speaking to the son of an irish absentee family nay do not be shocked my dear sir i tell you only because i thought it fair to do so but let me assure you that nothing you could say on that subject could hurt me personally because i feel that i am not but i never can be an enemy to ireland an absentee voluntarily i never yet have been and as to the future i declare i declare you know nothing of the future interrupted lady dashfort in a half peremptory half playful tone you know nothing make no rash bows and you will break none the undaunted assurance of lady dashfort's genius for intrigue gave her an air of frank imprudence which prevented lord colambre from suspecting that more was meant than met the ear the count and he took leave of one another with mutual regard and lady dashfort rejoiced to have got our hero out of halloran castle End of chapter eight